Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the great pleasure to, um, to, to be the third talk in this series of, um, of talks, um, which, um, as Sophie has said, um, will truly highlight some of the very special objects that we're very lucky to have um, within the museum's uh, collection here. So my first image uh, shows the man really that it's all about, um, the Dr. Wall here, um, painted by Michael Dahl, the great portrait artist, um, probably when he's in his 20s. Um, John Wall was born at Poick near Worcester on the 12th of October, uh, 1708. He was the only son of John Wall, a former mayor of Worcester, <clears throat> and he attended um, the Worcester King School and won a scholarship eventually to uh, Worcester College, Oxford in 1726. He studied there a, a series of classics, mathematics, algebra, and also experimented or experimental philosophy. And it was here that he may have kindled his lifelong love of painting. After the death of his father in 1734, the young John Wall became the ward of Samuel Sands of Ombersley Court in Worcestershire, uh, an amazing house that has just been uh, recently and very sensitively restored. Sands was a very important and well-known figure as he was a member of parliament for Worcester um, between 1718 and 1743 and eventually went on to become the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, he was also created a Baron in 1753 and was to um, uh, become the Speaker of the House of Lords later on. So Wall was under very good guidance. But in 1735, um, Wall became a Fellow of Merton College and qualified as a Bachelor of Physic um, at St Thomas's Hospital in London in that following year. And he qualified as a doctor of medicine, his MD qualification in June, 1739. He came, here's another, um, another image of him here, um, which um, is um, uh, within the, the town of the city of Worcester itself, he used to hang in the, um, um, in the infirmary on Castle Street and now in the museum there. We're very lucky enough to have the Michael Dahl portrait in the museum itself, so you all come and see that. <clears throat> in 1740, uh, Wall returned to Worcester and married Catherine Sands, who was a cousin uh, of the man that he was ward of, the cousin of um, Baron Sands. Wall had many interests and many activities, but he was associated originally um, with health and with um, setting up one of the um, uh, hospitals, one of the only five in the country at that stage, um, at Silver Street in 1740 in reaction to an incredibly bad epidemic of smallpox. He set this up with the bishop of the time of Worcester, um, who was Isaac Maddox. The Silver Street Hospital was very, very successful. And soon a bigger premises was needed. Dr. Wall used to visit this place time and time again um, from his home, which was at number 43, Borgate Street. I think it's that one there. Silver Street Infirmary was up here. And here we can see a wonderful detailed and very, very rare um, uh, map uh, that was drawn by a man called John Doherty in about 1752. There I lay before you the scene of Worcester at the time. Um, Dr. Wall's house, we'll just take a look at that. There it is, there. Um, this is a, a, a pen and ink um, sketch with a little colour in it. Um, by uh, Francis Edward Burney that is held um, within the Hive archive at Worcester. And here we have it. Um, it's actually uh, sketched in about um, the early 1780s when he did um, a, a, 
uh, quite a few of these sketches in and around Worcester and the county of Worcester. The idea was that he would create supplementary plates um, to the great volume um, of the history of Worcestershire um, by Dr. Treadway Nash. Um, they were never implemented. So we're lucky enough to have these um, wonderful um, uh, uh, drawings and sketches, the originals there at the archives. And go back to the map a little. Just to get your bearings, you can see um, the cathedral here, uh, dedicated to, um, to Mary, um, and also the Bishop's Palace here, um, now known as the Old Bishop's Palace. And um, what we have here, this is the um, Walmsley House. Um, and it was here that um, Dr. Wall eventually was to take the lease in um, May 15, um, 1751, um, together with his uh, great friend, William Davis, um, who was a, a chemist. And it was here uh, that they were um, able to uh, successfully um, bring together another 13 partners um, in order to establish the Worcester porcelain manufactory. The deed of partnership um, was actually signed um, in uh, June uh, 1751. Here's a small image of it here with the 15 partners' names, all the conditions thereof um, beautifully described. Again, we're very lucky to have this um, drawing and sketch, again, by John Doherty. He's quite a, um, an enigmatic character. Uh, he was one of the original of the, um, of, of, the, of the 15 partners. He was quite an eccentric. Um, he came from a family of, of surveyors and um, uh, map makers and sketchers. They'd originally come over from Ireland at the latter part of the 17th century. Um, they moved and were in Bewdley by 1708 um, and, um, and then Kidderminster, um, where they um, uh, sketched and had published the most wonderful early map um, of Kidderminster and its environs. Um, <clears throat> they went on to Worcester, uh, John Doherty or Doherty as it, was, um, as it was known then, the surname was simplified by the son John Doherty, which is how we tell them apart. Um, but they lived at St Edgar's Tower, um, so very close to, the, um, to our museum um, and in the environs of, um, of, of King's School. Um, that's where they lived until 1755. One of the other um, partners of the original concern was a man called Edward Cave. Dr. Wall was exhibiting some of his great entrepreneurial skills by bringing in a very important contact from London. Edward Cave was the editor and the man who wrote the Gentleman's Magazine. In fact, he owned that um, publication. He wrote under the pseudonym of Sylvanus Urban, and it was he that Dr. Wall brought in for, um, for, for marketing. And here we have the first um, image of the, of the manufactory, um, which was placed in the August edition, 1752, to show the capabilities, to show that Worcester were now following on in the great tradition from the, um, from the London porcelain manufacturers and producing amazing quality porcelain at Worcester and porcelain that could withstand boiling water. That was the great marketing trick. Another one of the great stars of, um, of our museum at Worcester is the original Paul Sandby 1760 watercolour um, of the city. Highly romanticised but still shows a bustling nature. Um, we see our great river here um, and, um, and the cathedral, St Mary's, um, towering over as it had done since medieval times. And you can just make out one of the bottle kilns here um, around the corner at Warmstry House. But how did it all come about? Well, it came about through a curious set of circumstances. Dr. Wall had 
got to know uh, William Davis, the chemist, and they'd actually experimented um, in Broad Street. This is one of the very, very rare um, surviving pieces of that duo's capabilities. Um, it is a remarkable teapot and cover now in a private Canadian collection. Um, the largest piece surviving of that particular recipe um, of paste. But the paste was quite brittle. They hadn't honed it correctly. And it was only with the, um, the acquisition of another firm that the secret was able to be rectified and the paste was able to be um, uh, honed in a way that would create that wonderful elastic body that Worcester has. That body with the addition of soap rock um, was able to take the expansion of boiling water and the cooling thereof after. So the ailing firm of Lunds Bristol, <clears throat> which was um, uh, uh, founded by Benjamin Lund, with the financial help and support of Mr. Miller, um, who eventually was to take his money away, which probably um, preceded um, the, the sale of the firm, in fact, undoubtedly did. <clears throat> but it was here, and we have to give them their credit, that Benjamin Lund, who had seen how porcelain was made at Limehouse and how it eventually was to fail or could fail for porcelain making in England, it was a risky business. Um, it was not supported um, in the way that it was on the continent, sometimes by rulers or great rich um, ruling magnates. There was not a bit of that here. You had to identify here what was um, important and the importance of um, the evolution of the early pastes in English porcelain cannot be overstated. Um, if we look here, we see the sort of objects that were, were being made towards the last um, year or so of, of the Lund's production. It only went on for two years. Um, poor Benjamin Lund having that money taken away. Um, but we, we, of course, were lucky that Dr. Wall persuaded um, the other 14 partners um, that this was a good idea. And eventually in March uh, 1752, the, um, the paste that they had there um, and also their moulds and the experience of the painters and modellers were all brought up the River Severn uh, to Warmstry House. Um, but what we see here are two very different uh, bodies. One of these is in um, an incredibly important private um, uh, collection from the United States. That's up here. That's this one. You can see, um, if you look at the pooling of the glaze around some of the uh, moulding, which, which is in quite crisp, low relief, you will see that there is a milky um, substance here suspended in the glaze. <clears throat> this is tin oxide uh, that is used to, to whiten, if you like, um, to create that um, that, that marvellous uh, glowing look that it has. It does have a little um, bluish tinge to the, um, uh, to the glaze as, as well, which entirely um, vaults its, um, it, its look of, of silver. Um, porcelain at this very early stage had to um, entirely uh, be brought under the characteristics of silver taste. Pieces that were based on specific designs by silversmiths, this was very important, produced at the manufactory as white porcelain and molding in relief where the ornament is the only decoration. Silver taste is something that must be adhered to um, in, the, in, in early English porcelain or in early continental porcelain, because you have to show the new and the novel material in the silver shape and form. This is how you're going to um, 
how you're going to, to please your, your customers, how you're going to take the eye of the aristocracy, the royal clients, um, those people, the mercantile classes that can afford to buy your new and novel material, it must be in a shape that they understand. And that shape and that substance that they understand so very well is silver. And here we have it, to appeal to the aristocratic and moneyed classes, to compete with silver trade in terms of novelty, because the fashionable forms were silver shapes. Here is a piece of um, Lund's Bristol, actually from the Bristol Museum um, in the A.J. Smith collection. And I would ask you to look at not only the, um, the, the porcelain um, bowl that we have here, the sugar bowl, um, but also compare it to a piece of um, very fashionable London silver manufactured by George Wicks in 1744. Now you can see that the, um, the chasing here um, on this spiraled bowl um, is wonderfully um, incorporates these almost cornucopia um, uh, designs of, of, of flowers. Um, these tendrils that spiral into the bowl itself. Well, <clears throat> you could do this in, in porcelain with, with moulds, but equally you could also do it with painting. And the cobalt um, uh, painting to the, uh, to the biscuit body was how you, you did that. You then put it under the glaze. I'm always saying to um, <clears throat> porcelain collectors, look at your borders on early blue and white objects and you will find that this is again a way that the trompe l'oeil style of the silver taste um, can be um, enhanced. So look at your border decoration and think of chasing or engraving. It's entirely what the porcelain painter is able to do in order to vault his piece um, to the silver taste. <clears throat> At Worcester, we see when they eventually bring up um, the, um, uh, the, the moulds, the expertise from Benjamin Lund's manufacturing, what we see is um, uh, a, a transforming evolution um, from Lund's Bristol here in 1748 through to the very, very earliest paste and glazes um, at Worcester. Um, but there's something wonderfully new. There is something here um, that is now embracing um, a lightness and an elegance of design um, on the white porcelain, which is, as I said to you, um, meant to be comparable to silver pieces. What we find here is an employment of chinoiserie decoration, um, creating these incredibly elegant objects. And here, perhaps one of the most important um, early Worcester teapots that there is, um, a chinoiserie moulded teapot, absolutely exemplifying the moulded silver forms of the early English porcelain. We can see here um, a countersunk cover um, to the piece. We can see these wonderful um, uh, moulded scrolls evoking, um, evoking chasing, um, and um, a multifaceted spout as well that we would normally see on a silver teapot. One of the stars of the museum here is um, a helmet-shaped ewer, um, enameled in that very, very early and, um, uh, and rare period of 1752-53. But what we have, if you look at the shape of this, is entirely a, a metal form. And the, um, uh, the metal form, if you were to take this off its stand and upturn it, you have an Athenian um, classical shaped helmet. Perhaps the greatest star of all of the early pieces in our museum is this cream jug here. It is known as the Wigornia cream jug and um, was in a, a collection 
um, from Nova Scotia uh, until 1973. In November that year, it was bought on behalf of the museum by the, um, the great porcelain dealer, Bob Williams. And underneath it, in a rather unique way, is molded Wigornia, the Latin name for our city. So one of the most celebrated pieces, quite a small piece, but absolutely jewel-like. Here on the other side, you can see these wonderful, um, elegant, um, uh, beautifully colored um, Chinese buildings um, within, a, within a, a scene from cafe that can only be dreamt up um, and birds in flight overhead. On the inside of the Wigornia cream jug, we have precious objects that are painted. They're tied with red ribbons um, to signify good luck um, and importance. Now, <clears throat> we have to cover the um, aspect of, um, of, of how designs and shapes and forms are disseminated um, throughout the early English manufacturers. And so the man that I'm showing you here, as you can see, is Gabriel Herquier, and um, it's painted by Jean Perronneau. Um, Herquier um, established a, a, a printing house on the Rue Saint-Jacques in Paris, and um, he was ostensibly um, involved in, um, in, 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 in having engraved these wonderful designs that were emanating from uh, French um, artists and craftsmen of the period. So we have a design here, for example, which is engraved by Aquier um, in 1740 um, from an original drawing by Francois Boucher, um, who was working with the Vincennes manufactory <clears throat> at the time um, and, um, and giving them um, further shapes and designs to employ in their own um, repertoire. But if you look carefully at this, you can see that the, um, uh, the printed design, which was disseminated in the uh, Livre d'Ornement in, in, in England um, in the 1740s, it's been used here by Nicholas Spremont um, to create a, um, a source boat for Frederick, Prince of Wales, the great Neptune service um, in 1743. Uh, there are four of these source boats and they are all uh, still in use at Windsor Castle. And the translation from an engraving through to silver, and then from silver through to porcelain, um, which is how we get that entire uh, transformation of design from idea, um, from the artist engraving, and then incorporating into silver, and then showing the new and the novel material of the porcelain in the silver shape, which has been um, executed here by uh, the Chelsea manufactory in their first period of the triangle period, um, 1745 to 49. This is from the Museum of London. Just showing you again how this can occur at Chelsea. Um, one of only two of these dolphin salts um, entirely taken from the Boucher original design engraved by Aquier. But coming on now, again, just um, still staying with Chelsea at the moment, but you'll see why I'm mentioning Jules Aurel Maisonnier, um, who was Orfeuve du Roi, or silversmith to the King of France, uh, to Louis XV. This is one of his great tureens that were, um, that, that were, were made by the um, Paris silversmiths uh, under his direction. Um, these were made for uh, Evelyn Pierpont, um, the Duke of Kingston, and are known as the Kingston Tureens. This is in the Cleveland Museum of Art. Um, <clears throat> the other one is in a Spanish museum. And here is the design for them, the surtout de table, uh, showing the two uh, Tureens on either side of an, an, uh, an, an amazing and rather crazily um, designed uh, marine centerpiece. <clears throat> Spremont chose to take the, uh, the crayfish 
um, from this design, but also from the top of the um, of the Turin designs uh, to form uh, one of his great uh, shapes and forms, the very, very rare um, crayfish salt. Sometimes there are two of them that occur. Uh, they have small dividers on the inside, which makes them exceptionally rare uh, for collectors to enjoy. But this is where my Sonnier comes into our sphere. Through the, um, the design book uh, created by Erquier, um, he engraves these designs originally thought up um, by Jules Storel Maisonnier, originally for silver, but here we see them translated into our own Worcester porcelain. Um, we see them um, from, actually, um, this example here occurs at Lunds Bristol, but I've chosen to, ex to um, exhibit um, a, uh, a shell here um, probably from about circa 1760, 65, um, and, um, and, and showing how uh, these designs um, are translated into our own porcelain with the addition here of molded English estuary shells. The knowledge of this type of, uh, of, of um, in encrustation here, uh, molding in, um, and then applying um, was um, uh, carefully created by a man called John Toulouse. Sometimes his pieces are marked um, underneath the museum's great example of um, a, um, if, you, if you think of the middle object here, we're all used to seeing these triple shell salts in many different manufacturers at this early stage. It was to take it a bit further and they produce um, a centerpiece, um, which marvels uh, the, uh, the onlooker. We can see turret shells here, uh, coral, uh, whelks, limpets, and all manner of other um, English estuary shell um, that is modeled and sometimes molded uh, from the life. <clears throat> The museum's slightly later example from about 1765 through to 1770 again shows how intricately uh, these objects are put together. Um, I have one here um, uh, which shows you how multicolored uh, they can be and decorated um, in many tastes. Um, mine is um, uh, European flowers. Um, and the museums on this occasion here has a very, very smart um, Grobler border, um, imitating the sort of um, uh, colours that were so in fashion in France at the time. <clears throat> Why is he showing me this, are you asking? The great wine system uh, modelled and um, made by Charles Frederick Candler, um, which is now in the um, Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, acquired in 1738 by Catherine the Great. Well, Worcester, not to be outdone with these very, very large um, uh, objects of, um, of, of great use, created um, what is probably the largest piece of first period Dr. War Worcester. Um, it's an important Worcester porcelain wine system. Whereabouts unknown, sadly. Um, it last appeared um, in about 1993. Um, we'd love to know where it is, of course. I suspect um, that, the, that the glaze on, on this extraordinary object is slightly grey and slightly bluish, again, to vault that trompe l'oeil effect of silver, for if you were to look at that in a room at night lit by candles, it would, it would sparkle as well as the wall appliques in silver on the walls. Here's our wonderful chinoiserie teapot again, comparing it to um, a Delamere piece in the Clark Institute. And you can see again how Worcester have taken the, the, the great part of, of something like this tea kettle 
um, and to produce something really quite remarkable. The Wigornia cream jug again here. What I've done here is to show you um, some uh, uh, tea caddies here that are in the collection of the Worshipful Company of Goldsmiths, uh, Goldsmiths Hall in London. Now you can see what they're doing at Worcester. They are showing the most fashionable design um, uh, of Delamere um, and translating it into their own unique porcelain um, with such grace and elegance. However, <clears throat> There is a collapse of this silver style. It gets abandoned in London in 1749. It's abandoned at Worcester, 1754. Why? Well, the success of the silver style causes its own demise. A larger factory production necessitates simpler forms. Now, why a larger factory production, I hear you ask? Well, because they've caught the attention of those people that are rich enough and um, want to acquire these sort of things, therefore they have to produce more. Um, it's supply and demand. Um, so that is why um, the manufacturer has to make simpler forms in order to make more. They couldn't continue on with quite an expensive, um, laborious, um, detailed approach, sadly, but, this is what occurred. The decoration then became painted decoration rather than molding. Because the new fashion for decoration seen at Meissen and Serve swept away the taste of silver forms. So you find these uh, ostensibly silver shapes suddenly being painted. They're sold. They're, they're, the, the objects are now um, slightly out of fashion because people want the um, porcelain to look like the very, very best and next thing um, from the European continent. So white porcelain, with, which is molded and, and finished, um, is then sold to outside decorators like this teapot, which has been decorated in London with beautiful butterflies. Um, but it's painted really now um, the painter who painted this, it's all about the, um, the, the, the enameling now and not about the silver form. We can see this clearly on this piece here, a very, very rare uh, cream boat um, in, in, this, in this regard of the silver shape and would have been entirely finished without being enameled. Um, but here it has been in the most wonderful um, chinoiserie taste, may have been decorated at Worcester, but may have been decorated outside the manufacturing. <clears throat> Here we have again um, a, um, a, a double handled, double lipped sauce boat. Um, again, would have been entirely finished in the white. They do exist, they're quite rare, they do exist. Um, but here decorated outside the manufactory in London, closely comparable to a teapot from Geoffrey Godden's collection um, with what's known as a scarlet coated gentleman here. Now, Worcester had one, just one last go at, at this. And if you look at the case of the, um, of the earliest um, printed um, decorated pieces at the Museum of Royal Worcester, you will see examples. You will see um, this piece here on the left, um, what is known as smoky primitives. They're the first type of transfer printing that occurs in about 1754, pioneered by the Holdship brothers, um, and then carried on by Hancock to some very, very detailed level as we go through the first period. But here, I want you to look at these in terms of the last gasp of the Trompe silver effect. So don't look at these as, as, um, as entirely decoration. Think of them as engraving, and then there you have it. They are like engraved silverware. And um, 
I think this is incredibly entrepreneurial again of Dr. Wall with obviously with with help from his um, from his skilled artists, but they've they've captured something quite clever here to produce porcelain that looks not just like silver, but engraved silver. Some wonderful early blue and white pieces. This again is one of the great stars of the museum. A huge, a simply huge tureen and cover with a jumping fish um, morphing as the, um, as, as the handle there, uh, which absolutely invites you uh, to stretch your arm over and lift it up. And imagine the clonking sound that the, um, uh, that the very heavily potted tureen uh, makes. Again, it's a silver shape when you come to think of it, um, but now ornamented and enameled in underglaze blue. Worcester perfected, um, really more so than, than, than many of the manufacturers, um, a, a really um, stunning level of, um, of, of, of focused accuracy with their cobalt painting. Uh, cobalt was put on, it had to be put on as, in a suspension of um, uh, spirits, um, finely ground up cobalt put on with spirits. Um, it's put on at the biscuit stage, so the porcelain is fired to the biscuit, therefore it cannot go back to a liquid clay of any type. And then you fire it on. And in firing the cobalt on, you fix it. And this is so important. And actually, it's one of the ways that you can tell a bit of very early Worcester from a piece of very late in the second year of the Lunds Bristol. The Lunds Bristol um, cobalt painters or the people at the Lunds Bristol manufactory hadn't really tweaked that. And so more often than not, on a piece of Lunds Bristol uh, porcelain, you will find that the cobalt blurs. Um, but at Worcester, it's perfectly fixed and, um, and, and highly focused. <clears throat> Another great rarity on the top left is a beautiful bleeding bowl of large, generous proportions. Um, one would love to, to, to glug brandy from it, actually, um, rather than think of it taking your blood, um, but each to their own. Um, a beautiful silver-inspired shape. You can see um, strap work here appearing on the great handle. Um, but what I would also invite you to, to look at and, um, and consider is the decoration here. The decoration on, on this piece, on the bleeding bowl at the Museum of Royal Worcester, I think we can safely say was... Um, uh, was, was, was done by a man who cut his teeth decorating Delft um, at Bristol. It's done with a fleeting hand um, because to paint with, with cobalt um, on, a, on a biscuit body, it'd be like painting, with, uh, painting on blotting paper. You had to be quite quick and you get these lovely washes that occur. Somewhere on there, there is a squirrel because it's running about the vine furiously looking for nuts or grapes. Um, a gugglet on the left-hand side from a little bit later on in the first decade of production and a vase and cover um, with what's known as the, um, the mob dowel pattern uh, taken from Jean Piemont's designs uh, at the end of the 1750s. Some incredibly rare pieces, again, from the museum's collection, um, which shows a, um, uh, uh, a sort of trumpet-shaped rectangular section of vase here on the left, painted in the, um, in the, in the Famille uh, Vert palette. And on the right, um, actually, um, uh, another piece of ornamental ware. Ornamental ware is very, very rare um, at this stage. Um, and such objects are the, are, are the central feature of any collector who's lucky enough to be able to find anything like this. Um, ornamental wares are far rarer uh, than usable wares. Um, and um, this one on the right, 
um, the twin handled um, hexagonal uh, vase is probably taken from a, um, a, a Chinese metal shape, um, evoking again uh, scenes from cafe. A gudlet and bowl. <clears throat> I think I'm right in saying this is probably a one and only. I don't think there is another. This is at the Museum of Royal Worcester. It was once in the collection of um, an amazing uh, collector from the period of just after the war, a man called Thomas Byrne of Rouse Lynch Court. And it was he that bequeathed um, these very important early coloured uh, pieces of some of the earliest of our um, manufacturer's production. We can date them to about 1754. Uh, why? Well, there are a series of um, tankards or mugs with the same design of the bird and the snail. There's the bird there looking um, at the snail as if it's about to be the lunch. And I think we're almost one stage further here. The snail looks in horror. Um, but um, a series of mugs that, um, that do survive, um, they bear a, an incised line or a, an incised um, cross, uh, which makes them known as scratch cross class. Those mugs are dated 1754. So um, we date the pattern, we date the body to 1754 and term it the scratch cross class. Very, very interesting mug in the British Museum, circa 1754, or perhaps a little earlier. Um, it also has an incised line this time on the underside of the base. It is painted unlike many other hands. I think you all um, fairly agree with me. We see a little scene coming through a window here, or perhaps a door, um, and on top, um, is um, a clock uh, painted in a, a, a wonderfully tenuous hand with old father time um, with a scythe up here and a, an hourglass reminding us that our time on this world is limited. No one gets out of here alive. Um, it's just a reminder as you pop through the door. Um, and, but what I wanted to show you was the, the tea equipage on the table. Um, and um, uh, uh, painted with tiny little brush strokes of blue, um, showing um, an underglazed blue tea uh, equipage or coffee equipage here, um, uh, actually in, in use. Remember this of what I show you, for we go on to, again, one of the most important pieces that the Museum of Royal Worcester has. It's known as the Tracy Mug. And it celebrates an extraordinary story in our uh, city's um, uh, uh, annals. What we have is a scratch cross piece of Worcester, but again by this wonderful tentative hand. Um, and we have um, Hercules and Antaeus on one side showing conquest. We have the arms of Robert Tracy um, hung on a pillar um, and, um, and, and telling us about the piece here, commemorates ye gratitude of the freemen of Worcester and Robert Tracy Esquire, who restored their liberty by def defeating an arbitrary power in that year, 1747. Well, what occurred in that year was an election. Robert Tracy and his running mate, uh, Sir Thomas Vernon of Hanbury, um, were the Whigs, and they were against uh, Thomas Gears Winford, who was the Tory. Now, the Tory won, Winford actually won the seat, but it was discovered afterwards that there was a bit of gerrymandering going on, and that 72 people were denied the chance to vote. Well, this caused mayhem in the town, as you can imagine. And um, they were given another chance to, uh, to, to vote uh, the following year. And happily, uh, Tracy won the seat and was restored to something that he should have had in the first place. Now, this piece 
is painted, in, in my opinion, and, and a few others now, um, by none other than Dr. Wall. We can't prove it at all, but we're almost positive that it was. Why? Well, let's go back to some of the images that we see upon the piece. Now, we can see this, again, rather tentative painting in the background here. Um, there's a historical feel about it, a sort of tableau, if you like. There is a great similarity to the piece I showed you um, in London at the British Museum. But Dr. Wall knew Robert Tracy very, very well. And um, I'll talk you through the, uh, the, the, the reasoning. We see Hercules raising Antaeus, as he did, um, in order to sap his power. By taking him off the ground, he was able to strangle and crush him. Um, it's taken from uh, a story in antiquity, but I wanted to show you on the left-hand side this wonderful painting from the Uffizi Gallery in Florence, um, painted by Antonello del Pollaiuolo in 1460. Um, Hercules was um, a, a, a man who was adored by the um, uh, uh, in Florence, particularly by the Medici. Um, and he was known, he, he was, he symbolized uh, a figure of fortitude um, and, um, and also conquest. Um, and this was something that was uh, well known um, in terms of the, of the symbolism. We also find uh, Hercules um, actually in the carving of the, um, of one of the panelled rooms at, at Hanbury where Sir Thomas Vernon lived. In, in the Hercules room, I think it's called. We then have um, uh, this wonderful armorial, which may or may not um, be painted by Wall, as I said, could be John Doherty. Um, he was um, somebody who used these armorial devices on his maps. It all looks quite similar, but that's for another time. But it's here I want you to look. Gratitude here. Underneath gratitude, we have the lion and we have Androcles here, um, who was the person that um, uh, took the thorn from the, from the lion's paw and eventually um, uh, during the uh, time of the first century AD, um, when he was um, uh, captured for his Christian approach and uh, thrown to the lions at the Colosseum at the time of Caligula. Um, it is said by Appian, um, the great writer who wrote um, Aegyptica in the first uh, century, um, the Egyptian wonders, um, we are told that um, the, the lion in the ring um, in the Colosseum um, was not only um, the, the 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 sort of greatest and strongest beast um, that the Romans had had ever caught, but it was also the lion um, who had been saved from a lingering death, probably by blood poisoning by Androcles. So of course, the lion wouldn't attack him, and Androcles was um, was forgiven. But Appian, if you look at the at the words in the um, Egyptian Wonders tract, um, Appian actually exclaims, this is the lion, a man's friend, and this is the man, the lion's doctor. And behind him is a wall. So you have the doctor of the lion, the lion is Tracy, in my understanding and my um, uh, interpretation. The man is the doctor of the lion, and the wall is behind him. So you have Dr. Wall. And I believe that is a, um, a, a way of interpreting um, a hidden signature. Some more pieces um, from the museum on the right-hand side here with an extraordinary bird 
um, and, um, and, 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 and rather exotic, um, but not um, copied from um, any uh, type of, um, of naturalistic production here, or publication. On the bottom right, we have a lamprey handled ewer. Um, the Guildhall had these wonderful lamprey suppers that occurred once every year when the lampreys came up the river. Um, and these, I think, in um, uh, probably more so than um, usage with cream, were used for a, a sort of fish sauce. We have um, uh, the success um, to Lord Sands here um, from, the, from the British Museum um, showing um, Dr. Walls, um, the uncle of the um, of 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 his wife, Brilliana, um, and the man who um, um, who looked after uh, Wall um, in legal terms uh, after his father died. Some incredible pieces of yellow ground from the museum's collection. Um, and um, Dr. Wall again and his decorators showing um, uh, uh, a unique success um, by incorporating Chinese um, uh, colors, the yellow ground um, that was associated with the very finest wares of, the, um, of China's production, um, but also um, putting um, these wonderful Moorish um, panels and filling them with European flowers. So you get complete cross-section of, of design. Even some Japanese here with chrysanthemum, this wonderful scroll border of iron red. <clears throat> now, back to um, a man that we saw in the, um, uh, in the shells encrusted um, with smaller shells. We have John Toulouse. John Toulouse creates a, a, a wonderful walking um, handle here that we see on the right hand side it used to be in the Zarensky collection in America um, and um, and we can see that that very design has its link from uh, Chelsea porcelain at number C at, at letter C rather and back to Nicholas Spremont as a silver um, uh, derivative and John Toulouse uh, creates these wonderful early Worcester figures of um, Turks, sportsmen and gardeners. Um, and um, these are um, examples from the museum collection and also very, very rare little pipe tamper here. Now, if I show you a pair of these from the cabinet in the museum, if I show you the original design source, um, which is from the book um, Recoil de Santé Stamp, um, created by the um, uh, Marquis Ferriol. Um, and on the right, we have the Grand Seigneur. Um, Worcester clearly saw um, printed design, um, original um, design for the Recoil de Santé stamp in order to um, make it into, into porcelain. And here we have another uh, watercolour by Francis Edward Burney in the collection of the Hive at Worcester. Um, you can see here they were drawings, as I said before, um, to uh, intended as an addition to Dr Nash's history of Worcestershire. But on the right hand side here, you can see one, some of the products of the Worcester porcelain manufactory. And there is a standing Turk with his sword alongside a scratch cross period trumpet shaped vase and a blue and white teapot on the left. One of the, um, one of the unique pieces of the museum is a Cupid from Vulcan's Forge on the right hand side. A tiny piece of this was found in the excavations in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, Bernard Watney, uh, the great um, doctor of ceramics, if you like, uh, the great collector, um, had got this um, model in his own collection and immediately um, uh, recognized the tiny fragment that came out in Henry Sandon's hand and then several weeks later presented him and the museum uh, with this wonderful model. You can't see one anywhere else. 
um, and on the left-hand side, a pair of uh, canaries, or what really are birds in branches, another of the greatest rarities of our museum's collection. Just moving on a little now into the period of James Giles decorated porcelain, um, an amazing teapot, teapot um, that Brian Horton and I found in America, um, but um, rather unique in terms of, um, of the Giles output, because it actually has seven patterns on it. The seven panels are all different. Um, and we have um, the color turquoise, which is to do with marriage. It's the color of betrothal. Um, and we have heart-shaped panels showing lovers uh, talking uh, within their family trees here on their own bench, which is their um, uh, span of life with lovebirds on, on top of them there and more lovebirds on the back um, over, 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 over a pear and rose hips, which of course are the fruit of love. Roses are on the, um, uh, are on the cover. Um, now we have um, here, I don't quite know why my, um, let's get it, try and get it down again. Oh, uh, well, we have to carry on. Um, the um, uh, the uh, slot bill from the service, you can actually see at the, at the museum itself, a great rarity and one of only four pieces um, from that um, uh, service. And um, there, that's better. And some of the greatest stars of the museum now, this pair of, of, uh, of, of very large hexagonal tomato ground vases and covers painted with exotic birds taken from one of the great publications of the, uh, of, um, of, of the Enlightenment, George Edwards's Natural History of Uncommon Birds. And, um, and we have the long-tailed finch here, which, which existed um, and was owned by a birdman in London. Edwards went to see it um, pretty much every day during its molting and regrowth season. Um, and um, James Giles Atelier have chosen to use the uh, plates from Edwards's publication um, to decorate these incredible vases. And um, important provenance for the museum. Well, there couldn't be any better provenance really than this piece on the right. Um, it is from the Duke of Gloucester service. He was the younger brother of um, George III, William Henry, Duke of Gloucester, um, and his portrait here painted by Zoffany. It's one of the greatest of the services that were produced at Worcester. It's also the earliest of the Royal Commissions. Um, probably from about 1775, richly decorated to match his earlier Chelsea service, which is often referred to as the Duke of Cambridge service, but was undoubtedly commissioned by the Duke of Gloucester. Um, the Duke of Gloucester um, left both services to his nephew, sorry, to his son, and on his son's death in 1834, the um, services were inherited by this man's brother, i.e. the uncle of who they'd gone down to by descent. That was the Duke of Cambridge and often the, the, uh, the um, mix up has occurred because of that. The, the Museum of Royal Worcester's great tureen from this service is a breathtaking object. As you can see, um, there is no expense spared. Um, the service is generally marked with a gold crescent mark. Jeffrey's Hammett O'Neill, we can only briefly touch on, um, but his great tableau um, of um, fable decoration, as we see here with the um, wolf and the sheep, but also these amazing vases. These are actually from the Frank Lloyd collection in the British Museum, but there is a wonderful array of O'Neill vases at the museum for you all to go and see. And the other great painter of the first period, brought up from London, just as Jeffreys Hammett O'Neill was uh, by Dr. Wall, um, is John Donaldson. And um, these evoke everything 
um, in terms of um, the latest fashion from, from France. And it's Worcester's own unique take on that um, incredible uh, painting. So we come to the end of the lecture now. And Dr. Wall, <clears throat> in his 67th year, um, after a, um, a, a brief sojourn in Bath, um, actually died there, exhausted, um, at the end of his life. And um, the epitaph uh, needs no explanation. After a life of labour for the good of others, nature gave him talents, a benevolent heart, directed by the application of them to the study and practice of a profession most beneficial to mankind, and by an uncommon genius for historic painting, an amusement worthy of his enlarged mind. He has produced many lasting evidences of the noble simplicity of his sentiments and the extensiveness of his abilities. Husbands, fathers, friends, and neighbors saw in him a living pattern of their duties and ever must remember the various excellences of that heart, the loss of which they now lament. So, ladies and gentlemen, I leave you with the aged Dr. Wall. Thank you. <laughs>